Hello, and welcome to the Active Atom Educational Series. Part 4 Precision Machine Spindle Break In Procedure. Wow, that's exciting. You know what this is saying now? This means we're just about ready to wrap it up. Yeah. This is a simple part of the, probably one of these, well, it probably is. In fact, it is the simplest part, so long as you've done everything right. Why don't you explain what I were saying right there, Patrick? Right, because we've, we've done a lot of work. You know, we've disassembled a spindle. We've cleaned all the parts. We've painted. It, uh, painted, uh, cleaned the felts. You know, did some, did some measuring the spindle, uh, measured for our high spot on the spindle. We uh, reassembled the spindle. So we've done quite a lot of work. So we're finally at part four, and part four is focused just on the breaking procedure. That's it. Yeah. So and so we're really thrilled about this because we're we're almost. We're gonna mount it on a lathe bed, and we're gonna give her some spinning. That's right. Some controlled spinning. Yeah, so before we start the procedure, which Lance is going to actually do that entire procedure. Um, uh oh. <laughs> no, he's the expert at that. So we just want to talk about, uh, just go over just a few things first. Okay, one of the things we want to uh, talk about is, you know, when you start this procedure, we want to emphasize that your spindle is 100% assembled. That's it. Right. You should have not a single part left to assemble. So it should be 100% assembled and ready to take to your machine. That's right. right? That's right. Okay. Okay. The other, so the second thing we really want to emphasize. This is a big one. Yeah, this is a big Please. one. Because we know that we've, we've talked to people that have moved forward prematurely and they really shouldn't have started the breaking procedure. No. And what we want to talk about is about the condition of the spindle. And the, or the function, you know, before the break-in procedures uh, actually perform, the spindle should function, you know, smoothly. You know, when you rotate the spindle with your fingers, you know, and make your rotations like I'm doing right here, you know. So it's just like this, you know, as you can see me turning the spindle, see, or you, you know, it should feel silky smooth. You know, again, you know, we keep, uh, we keep uh, reiterating that, you know, because angular contact bearings are preloaded, you're going to have that resistance, but that's fine. But it should be silky smooth and you should also feel no obstruction. You know, you shouldn't feel any grit, you know, like there's a, you know, there shouldn't be any uh, hair, dust, grit, anything in the bearings. Because if the bearings are contaminated in any way, you're going to feel that. So you shouldn't, it should be silky smooth. Yeah. Okay, and also you shouldn't feel any binding. And what I mean by binding is you know, you're turning the spindle, it feels smooth, and all of a sudden it's it sticks. There's a yeah, resistance. Our, our break is not to remove your binding. <laughs> yeah, and, that, and that's what we want to emphasize is, is you shouldn't have any of the conditions I just talked about going into this procedure because this break-in procedure is not a fixed procedure. Oh no, it's a damaging procedure actually. Yeah. You, you move forward here and you're not right, you're done. Yeah, and that because we've talked to people, you know, where, you know, they've had a binding issue or, you know, some other issue and they figure, oh, we'll, we'll run the break-in procedure and, you know, hopefully that resolves the problem. And that's a good time to bring up a certain point. That's why, and I know we're reiterating everything to death yeah. here. It, it's because we only get one shot. That's I just don't right. want you to buy more bearings. But no, right. I, I'm just saying. So, so you know, we, that's why Patrick said that a thousand times in these <laughs> recordings. That he, after every little screw and every little piece of felt was put together here, he tested it. He tested that spindle every time to prove to you that's a good that it point. was never having a trouble. That's right. Something that could still be fixed. No, that's a good point. Yeah, remember that? Every time we installed a new part, I always spun the spindle to make sure that, you know, I didn't do, we didn't do anything when we added a part. No. Yeah, because it's so important. You know, we got it. We don't start part four unless the spindle feels perfect. Because, you know, after this break-in, let me tell you something. The last thing you're going to do, if your spindle even needs it right, is the grinding. That's right. Yeah, and it's an if project. That's, That's not a mandatory if. project. This is a mandatory. 
This the break-in's is, mandatory. Yeah, that's On good. anger contact bearings, and I, I, we suggest, well, that's fine. Well, we actually, that's, I'm glad you brought that up because the break-in procedure we're actually going to discuss in this part is actually really for angler contact bearings used in machine spindles, but you know, we we personally run it for all the spindles we rebuild, even if it's like tapered roller bearings. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna get into that though. Yeah, but we'll get more into that. And there's a big reason for all of this coming in the closing part six. That's all I wanna say there. Sure. It'll all make sense that day. Exactly. All right. Okay, and then lastly, uh, I just want to kind of talk about, um, you know, people that have read maybe, you know, prior to, you know, performing the spindle rebuild procedure on your spindle, you know, you'll go ahead and down, you know, download some of the catalogs from the different bearing manufacturers. Oh, yeah. And I just want to mention, you know, it's really confusing because you're going to find out that every bearing manufacturer and, you know, even the different machine manufacturers, everybody has their own breaking procedure that's the way it is and that's what it and and the thing is is a lot of these procedures aren't even close they're so different right you know like some manufacturers or even some bearing manufacturers really simplified breaking procedure like a three-stepper you know run it at the, for this length for 50 percent rpm and so forth where others is very extensive true so so I, why, why I say that is because, you know, if you happen to read all these different catalogs from different bearing manufacturers and so forth, you're going to see a lot of different breaking procedures. And basically what we did is, you know, just from years of experience of doing this ourselves, we just basically took the best pieces from each manufacturer that we felt work best for us. Yeah, that worked best for us for the 11 spindles. Cause see, that's the other but thing. But back in the beginning, we just followed everything like a book. Uh oh, exactly. it says two hours and four seconds. Okay, not six seconds, not two seconds, four seconds, you got it. Right, and it's hard. Go, nah. Yeah, it's hard because, you know, like you read the SKF documentation and they tell you do it this way. You read the Barden documentation, they tell you do it this way. And you're like, okay, well, so what? Well, then don't forget, if you read 11, they've probably got a whole other story to share with you over there. And they do. <laughs> I've asked them, and their breaking yeah. procedure is entirely different. So so we just want to kind of share that with you. And um, We so, just want you to have the best experience, okay? Yeah. So I guess we're, we're, we're really just opening up and saying, hey, look, this is what we do. It works best for us. The world's different for everybody. But if you like what, you're, like, if you like what you've seen so far, continue along. You're going to be in yeah. good hands. Okay. Great. I think that covers everything. It does. Okay. Part four, section one, tools required. Well, I like the word tools. <laughs> That's all we ever do around here is have a lot of tools, don't we? We do, and we love tools. Somebody a little more than the other. <laughs> That's all right. But you know, when I hear that word tools, that means he, he hides them from me. And that's fine. We've made that clear over the years. <laughs> Uh, it's funny how after decades, all of a sudden that I think something's new. It's actually been here for two years, <laughs> five years, ten years. Oh, yeah. And so he just, you know, so this is my chance. When he has to share them with you, he has to share them with me. See? Well. So I kind of like having to film all these uh, spindle rebuilds. And maybe I'll come up with another category that requires even more tools. That is true. You do make me bring out all the tools. A little smooth move there. <laughs> all well, right. In, in my defense... The tools we're going to show you, we did bring them up briefly in part one. Yeah, he did. He listened yeah. to them. That really doesn't make the same difference as having to see them. <laughs> oh, that's all right, though. No. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to be using these tools. And yeah. this is uh, my, my uh, temperature meter. So, but there's a special wire hanging out of this temperature meter, isn't there? That's right. This isn't the usual one. Um, let me just show you what the temperature meter looks like. So this is your basic, you know, uh, this is what most temperature meters look like. Basically, just a single function, you know, uh, Fahrenheit or Celsius and so forth. And that's it's just that's all we want to do. We just want to uh, get accurate temperature readings of the bearings. Okay, but really important is the bearing manufacturers, they recommend a type K thermocouple. And... You know, and some of you may be familiar with this. They always come with this standard connection to the meter. And then they have this like little soldered ball at the end. And it's this little soldered ball that actually takes the temperature. 
Okay. And with that, uh, what we use is... You know, we've been at this a lot of years, so he, we've come up with this neat way to not ruin our beautiful paint jobs. Huh? Yeah, because see, what we used to do in the past is... See, we use two temperature sensors real quick. Is because, see, on the spindle, we've got the angular contact bearings at one end. Right in here. Yeah, yeah. right here. Mm -hmm. And then we've got the single deep groove bearing at right the other right end. There. Yeah. So what we do is we use two meters with two sensors so that we can monitor, yeah, see here and here, so we can monitor each individual bearings, the bearing set and the single bearing. But especially really important here. Yeah, this one's really where it's almost it like, mattered. Yeah, this is where it really matters because how are you, how are you gonna measure both bearings or the, this set and the single bearing at the same time with one sensor? So you almost need two meters. But yeah, because we also like two meters even here on the, on the, on the headstock, right? The closed, the open headstock, the closed headstock. And the reason is, is that, that by time that temperature gets from one to the other, let's say we're monitoring it here. That's right. I mean, by time it does something, it's pretty much all over with. We really want much more accurate reads, and these are not an expensive tool. No, these days you could find these for really low cost. In fact, I'm I'm really excited because, well, you know, these aren't expensive tools at all at this procedure. This, no, this is nothing. So, so I mean, no. that's not nothing, but but they're but but this very is worth affordable. Getting, very affordable compared yeah. to some of the tools we're working yeah. with. Say like my uh, other tool that's coming up in a minute here, but not yet. <laughs> Okay. So oh, yeah. So anyway, what Lan I just uh, clarify. So Lance is saying if we had only one meter with one sensor, we would likely put this in the middle of the spindle for the closed style headstock. But see if one of these bearings, or uh, the set or the single bearing gets hot, which one is a problematic right. set? This doesn't say the one. This meter doesn't go that way. That's right. <laughs> or that way. So that's what we recommend too. And so what we used to do is. So in order to get an accurate reading, the bulb right here, this end, has to be touching the surface, okay? And we used to place tape, but the problem is, is we, we experiment with different tapes. Well, and it heats up and then it gets, and then it gets, ruin our paint. That's right, the adhesive sticks on here. Sometimes we lift the tape and it takes the paint. That just happens. And, oh, yeah, and happens just, so we... We ended up finding this solution. It's just your general magnetic tape that you can get at most general. Like refrigerator magnets. Yeah, ma refrigerator magnets. And this can you can get at any hardware store. And it's really easy to use. You know, usually it has an adhesive side, but that doesn't matter. We We're don't not use that. It. Yeah. What we do is we just cut a piece of it, and then we use this to basically just hold the sensor in place. And it works really good for the open head. Yeah. Open style. See, because, yeah, even for this where you've got the radius, see, it works perfect. See, yeah, just see, like just this. Just right in place for you. You can't be holding with your hand. You'll get the wrong reading. <laughs> that's right. And it's not too strong that's going to damage anything, but it works perfect. And, and can I just bring up something here that I just want to share? Because we're getting down into where I'm going to be doing this right here. Mostly. Sure. Is we were saying it was okay to do this with your hand, um, to, to monitor it with your hand. I'm going to take that back, and here's why. Ambient temperature. I have no idea if you're in the Sahara Desert or in Alaska. And, and amb ambient temperature has a lot to do with this. I don't want the readings, you see. When your hand, may, like Pat points out to me, well, my hand might feel this. Your That's hand right. may not. Different people have different sensitivity to heat. Right. So, how, so one person may think it's excessively hot. Another person may think it's just warm. That's right. So We're different. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so I, I want to take that back a little bit. I mean, you can do it. The world won't end. Yeah. It's talked about, you know, if you talk to some people, they'll tell you, you can use the palm of your hand as long as you can keep your palm on the headstock or the spindle housing. Right. And it should be fine. But again, we don't like that. We don't like to take guesses. So really, and because the uh, temperature meters are so affordable, you know, just, and you know, there are some meters that actually have two inputs. So two sensors. So that could be another option to oh, save money. Oh, that's a money. good point. I, yeah. I have seen that. Yeah. We don't have that, but I've seen that. Yeah. Do um, you want me to go first or do you want to do yours? Oh. Okay. Let me just drop mine in real quick. Sure. Okay. The expensive tool on this is from the from part three, actually, right? That's right. Part three. And that's where we checked the high points on the little surface plate. And we used the little uh, one micron resolution test indicator. That's correct. 
But we had that on the height gauge, as you pointed out to me today. That's right. And I'm going to use the mag magnetic based little holder there. That's little, right. Little stand for it. Yeah, because, see, we're going to actually take the measurement readings on the lathe bed. So that's why we need that magnetic base. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a good point. And this is something that we've already used. So this isn't a new tool. Right. So you already have bought this yeah. or have this. It's not adding another tool, but it is an expensive tool. Yeah. It's just real sensitive. Okay. Yeah, very sensitive. Okay, no, great. Okay, now what's you got in the little bag? <laughs> and this is actually an affor affordable tool I'm going to show you. Yeah. Okay, this is an RPM meter. And it's really simple, a really common, um, you know, it comes with a little, some little strips of magnetic tape or reflective tape, I'm sorry. And basically you just cut a little square, a little sure. piece, and it's adhesive back. And what you do is you just stick that piece in your spindle. Like in this case, you know, we would stick it right here at the end. You think they should wipe off their nye oil a little bit to make it adhesive oh, that's, and stick? That's a good point. Okay, yeah. then they can just put some more nye oil on when they're all done, just touch up these two ends. <laughs> no, you're right, because I've done it too, where I didn't wipe Flip. it, and, yeah, and it just <laughs> falls, it falls right <laughs> off. Yeah, and it's really easy, you know. So, and if this meter, you know, when you turn it on, so you can see that, that laser, the red laser. So it's really easy to use. When it's running, you just point the laser at that reflective tape that's spinning around, and that's going to give you a very accurate reading of the true RPM. And this is a handy tool in the shop anyway. We can use this to check the RPM, true RPM of motors we rebuild here. We refurbish them and rebuild them. And yeah, and you know what's nice too, what I use it for? Is, um, like, let's say I'm turning something. Yeah. And it's just turning beautifully. And it's like, wow. It's Let me just, mark that and, down yeah, so I know that for next time. Exactly. I want to know <laughs> that, that exact RPM. Oh, yeah. Exactly. So, no. So, this is so useful. Everybody should have one in the workshop. Very good. Yeah. And, um, and then lastly, the only thing we want to bring up is, uh, you know, like in our case, you know, we don't rebuild spindles for a living. No. Because, see, if you rebuild spindles for a living... You're going to perform this break-in procedure like on a test platform. Yeah, that's what they make. They make specialized spindle rebuild test platforms, and I've seen rooms full of those. Yeah. They're awesome, but and, and they're we don't even have one. Yeah, and they're built just to do break-in procedures. Oh, yeah, but they have meters and everything on them, so they, they'll do everything as if it was on a machine. That's because right. they don't have the machine. They just have the spindle. That's right. But see, in our case, and probably your case as well, you don't do this for a living. No. So at this stage, we just want to bring up is... Be sure when you start this procedure that your main machine is ready to go. See, in our case, uh, well, we we did all that. When we clean these, we clean the bases and and the, even the chip pans and everything, and then we painted them all. That's right. So we're ready to go with yes, that so, way before we got the spindle rebuilt. That's right. See, uh, the, Lance is going to take this over uh, to a different location I where am. the lay setups at. And see, we already have all that the whole platform's ready to go. I know, I'm already, excited. Yeah, it's already set up. The motor's ready to go. All Lance has to do is just fuse the belt. That's oh, it. that's a good point. Okay, we won't be showing no. the fusion of the belt, but if you want to see how we do it. We've done it. Yeah, go to Shop Adventures 13. Yeah, and best of all, it's one of these times I can say this, but we've just been really lucky. Yeah. Our, our, our our shows are in our videos both get a lot of great commentary they from do. the comments and in those comments at that shop adventures 13 down in those comments some brilliant people and we mean brilliant they've even and we we say that because we've learned from them oh yeah as well they've got different tips and techniques on how they fuse belts and keep it from going clack, 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 clack. that's right so they're yeah. very good and we were so impressed they a lot of people chimed in on those so there go there read the comments after you watch the video on how we fused it and go see what they did yeah. you might want to try one of their procedures definitely we sure value those comments okay oh yeah definitely okay great we'll be back part four section two let's talk about the break-in procedure yep what is this voodoo magic? I thought a bearing manufacturer knows how to make a bearing and I don't need to do anything but put it in and run it. You know, this is a common question we get because, and it's a legitimate question. You know, you buy the expensive bearings, 
Why do you have to run a braking procedure on these expensive bearings? Shouldn't they be ready to go? Well, maybe I thought maybe you were trying to perform some kind of value-added voodoo <laughs> magic. <laughs> well, let me explain to you. Um, actually, the bearings themselves mechanically don't need a break in. You know, when so the bearings out of the box after installation on the spindle, mechanically they're ready to be ran at full speed at its full load immediately so there's no break-in procedure pertaining to the bearings themselves you know the ball bearings bearing races and so in cage and so forth so this has something to do with centrifugal force and the grease uh -huh. see this is all about the grease because if you remember we precisely injected the grease you know inside the bearing raceways with that fancy syringe that's right with the syringe and see, with all that grease in there, we now have to run a braking procedure in order to in order for a proper distribution of the grease. That's right. See, because see, all the grease is current. You know, when we first start this braking procedure, all the grease is all sitting in that bearing raceway inside. So we, inside. In, inward. Inward from the outer race. Inward. That's right. Inward. And we're gonna we're gonna do like an amusement park ride, aren't we? You know where the the people are all in those chairs and the cables are hanging down and they're all hanging straight down and it starts turning and it starts turning faster and pretty soon they move out like this and they go out like that and the people are going around way on the outside. Yeah, can even go in a till yeah. when they're sticking to the wall. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the reason why you don't want to take a brand new spindle rebuild and run it at full speed because all your grease is just going to go... Well, people fly boom. off the ride. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, cables might snap there. That's why the braking procedure... The process is really a gradual process going from a very slow RPM and gradually increasing it all the way to maximum RPM. And the purpose for that is because we got to gradually force that grease in the raceways to gradually move outside of the ball bearings in the bearing cage. That's right. You know, and that's what this whole braking procedure is all about. Because, see, if, if we keep all that grease inside and you just run the spindle, the number one symptom you're going to get is excessive heating. Yes. See, and you don't want that because that can cause, that's where you can cause damage. I heard there's something that doesn't cause any damage, but it's also not a good sign. And that's my ability to touch this and feel cold. Yeah, you know, you would think, you know. If well, that's good. Yeah, if you're doing this breaking <laughs> procedure and your temperature meters are reading like room temperature with no heat being generated, you know, some people may think, wow, that's a great thing. My oh, spin yeah. But actually, you don't, that's a condition you don't want. Uh -huh. in, in, a, in a successful spindle rebuild, you know, with the bearings properly preloaded, the bearings are going to generate heat. It's going to fluctuate too, you said. Yeah, and it's going to flu fluctuate. Okay, so let's say, let's say you're in a scenario where you don't feel or read any uh, heat. Okay, what that's an in indication of is that the angular contact bearings aren't preloaded. Oh. See, and that's what would cause that because it's the preload of the two angular contact bearings that's generating the heat. Oh. See, so if you're getting no heat generated at all, it means perhaps maybe your spindle nut's loose, you forgot to tighten it. Maybe it's not tightened hard maybe enough. Maybe the two bearings aren't seated together or pressure between the two aren't put down. That could be it. Maybe when you're installing the bearings, you didn't hammer them all the way or the something. The spacer maybe is not, you didn't get them all the way against the spacer. It could be anything. It could be a lot of things, yeah, right. You need to just check your work. Yeah, just check your work and make sure everything's secured and fastened. There's a lot of investigation to yeah, in these things. Yeah, exactly. So, so, that's what, so that's what you want to look at. And yeah, so during the procedure though, Let's look at the other end. Let's look at excessive heat. Okay, during the uh, breaking procedure, it is normal to see spikes in heat. Okay, because as we're working that grease yeah. outside the raceways, you're gonna get a lot of resistance, you, yeah, a lot of get, force there. Yeah. yeah, you're gonna get a lot of resistance. Your heat buildup is gonna it's, it's distributing. It should get balanced out. And yeah, that's a key. The key is that if you see these heat spikes, that it gradually goes away. Yeah, don't panic. Yeah. It should break through, finalize, and it should stabilize and then run at a temperature with a slight climb over a long period of time. That's like right. It's like you, were, like you were running it. Right. And Lance will get into more details when he oh, actually yeah. does a procedure. Because if you do see spikes of in, 
spikes of excessive heat that doesn't go away, there are procedures on what you want to do to try, you know, you have to kind of like go backwards a little bit and then move forward again. But what you don't want to see is you don't want to see a spike and then that excessive heat never going away. No. See, if that heat's never going away, that could be a, a sign of another problem, such as, you know, maybe the bearings aren't seated properly. Maybe there's a binding going yeah, on there's, somehow. There's some binding going on exactly that's causing the heat that's not related to the grease at all or the preload. Oh, that's great. Okay, so, can I butt in now? Okay. I can't hardly wait. I want to <laughs> show off something, and it's not something shiny, perfect, and, and uh, typical Active Atom fashion around here. <laughs> We're actually going to show you something we really do for a living. That's right. So let's remove this beautiful uh, museum piece, I would call it, even though it's going to not look that way for long. Let's bring this over, Patrick. Those are a lot of wear. And that wear is caused by what? Just from use. <laughs> from making a lot of parts. We make five to 10,000 pieces of the exact same part all the time. One little screw, one little pin, one little this, one little that. And we make them in runs and then we make 5,000 of these, 5,000 of those. And we make five or six parts. And you know, you start getting 30,000 parts. That's right. Sometimes 60,000 parts all through this spindle head, right? That's right. And so two things happened, Patrick. Why don't you share what, what the, you know, this is, and this is a, tell them about the quality of this film. Okay. Well, it is hard to believe real quick. It's nice to see a comparison. Yes. Okay. This nice one used to look like this, you know. So, you know, when you use your equipment, you know, it's going to show signs of use over time. And that's a good thing. It means you're, you know, making a lot of parts, which is a good sign for us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, More tools. See, what's really nice is, although there's wear, it's it's mostly just cosmetic. Yes. You know, if you notice, the, it's just the paint. But if you notice, the belt pull is still in wonderful well, this condition. Spindle's in, this spindle's in perfect uh, perfect condition. We, it's still, we still use it right now. So. Oh, that's a good point you bring up. See, we don't, we won't rebuild this just to rebuild it, to mm -hmm. make it look pretty. It's not, it doesn't need it. Yeah, it doesn't need it. Actually, before we started this uh, section, I actually removed these caps because I was curious how the bearings look like. Okay, you aren't really supposed to do that, but I was curious. But, <laughs> but no, you aren't hurting anything. Well, we are in a clean environment, but this is yeah. almost breaking the rules like cutting open those bags with the bearings in them before you're ready to install, grease them and install Well, you know why I was really curious? <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest. No, I know. I'll be honest, though. Why am I so curious? Because this head, this particular headstock, it's made tens of thousands of oh, parts for, for a lot of years. And I don't think we've had a and this headstock. is just one of them. This yeah, this is just, one, is just of one of them. Yeah, and we were just really surprised that the bearings feel so perfect, so good still. And she tests perfect. Yeah, it she's tests. A beautiful, she's a beautiful, beautiful spindle. Yeah, and it tests perfect. Beautiful headstock. Yeah, so we're just going to continue using it and, until we absolutely You want to get some close-ups of, of that in the belt? Look at this. Oh, yeah, it's nice to see. Sometimes you have to do a little filler work before you paint, see? To make it keep it looking pretty, but... Uh, You'll see there's some belt wears and there's some... Yeah, see the belt wear? Oh, yeah, we, see, we use this thing. See, that's the back of the spindle. I think that's Pat being a little too uh, aggressive with the, when he's machining. <laughs> <laughs> Caused the belt to flap there a little. But yeah, see, but, but when the time comes that we do have to rebuild this headstock, we will make it look just like brand oh, new Oh yeah, like you won't this. see the belt grooves or anything. It'll be gone. Everything yeah. will look, look like this one. It'll look exactly like mm -hmm. this one. So... Yeah, so they, yeah, we just want to share that with yeah, you because share that we really you know, do work for a living. This is really what we do do. Well, because especially we show you, you know, most of it looks like we're going to put this in a museum. And it's never going to make parts. Exactly. It's going to make tens of it's going to make our products, but it's going to make tens of thousands of them. That's right. Parts for it. So yes, it's it's fine. It, it and, and about five or six other other uh, headstocks are going to do this work. That's so, right. A lot going on. Okay. So, no, that's good to share. Isn't that neat. Yeah. We're not all picture perfect around here. <laughs> Okay, great. I guess uh, we'll meet you at the other... We're going to move me to a new table and I'm going to do right. some break-in. Oh, how great. Great. Part 4, Section 3, Spindle Preparation and Measurements. Okay, as promised, we're over here at our test station we have set up for you. And I want to go over everything that's on the table and Patrick's going to help me here. 
before we we're going to show you what we get and what we're here to do right now is to get the preliminary uh, indicator readings that we can establish from inside the spindle's call it seat is that what we want to do yeah okay this indicator as we've mentioned in our in our materials and tools that were required for the job is this, this is a one micron indicator or, or also known as a 40 millionth right patrick yeah but um yeah, one micron is equal to about 40 millionths of an inch, or you can use also a 50 millionth test indicator if you have an imperial test indicator. Oh, okay, great, okay. Right. But as you know, we're metric here, so yeah. It's Even though the 11s are all imperial. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a little confusing. Okay, so you'll notice that, that we're all set up. We've What we've done is, and, and I guess it was really important, is we want to make sure we fuse this belt, we have our pulley set at the maximum RPM this machine can perform. And that's the small pulley here, see, and the large one here. That's, that's correct. That's as fast as that's. This is not a torque thing. This is about high-speed RPM. No, you're, you're correct. Right. Good point. And there's those fancy little uh, uh, temperature meters that we're all getting ready to go here. And our two little magnets are all cut to size, so they'll wrap right Oh, sorry there. Okay. So they'll wrap right on here and here. So we know that's all set up. Um, okay. And then again, then we have our RPM meter over here because we're going to be using it, but not yet. Okay. And what we're over here to share with you right now is what kind of preliminary reading after all those hours of cleaning and fixing are we able to get? Well, before we do that, I just want you to notice that we're using a, a steric miniature little uh, indicator holder. <laughs> yeah, it is tiny. And the reason yeah. is... It's, it's, it's on a piece of paper because we don't ever want to uh, mar these uh, uh, the bed way. Yeah, this magnet's really strong, and so yeah. we don't want to scratch or you know damage the bed at all. It's just not worth the rest of a piece of paper. We're not going anywhere here. We're not trying to hold down the Titanic. It's just a, it's just a good habit we, we Yeah, use. practices. Yeah. Oh, good Lord, too many practices here, <laughs> I know. You cannot use this. Look, we use this all the time, so don't. It, it's not like it's this is better and this is worse. For this kind of application, with this kind of sensitivity, you're about ready to see us demonstrate the what kind of reading we have here. We just we just don't recommend this type. Yeah, because um, we use them for if you're using like a one thousandth or a five tenth test indicator. Oh, it works great. We use it, but we found that when we use like this one micron test indicator on it, <laughs> what it's doing it's so sensitive that it's actually reading the flex in these arms. Yeah, and a lot of people yeah. have done uh, great videos on that, about the amount of flexibility they see in there, and, yeah. the, and the way it, it hangs and puts, yeah, it's quite a lot. That's quite amazing. When Yeah, if you've never used a really high-resolution test indicator before, it's amazing the movement you see on anything yeah. and everything. Yeah. yeah. There's no hiding anything here. No. Okay, this is a basic test sheet from Lewis Levin and Son out of Santa Fe Springs, California. Yeah, and this is, this is a sheet from Levin, and this is what they use. This is everything we'll be doing at the end of this build here, pretty much. That's correct. Right now, where you're at, is we're checking, we're going to check for concentricity of the collet seat, which is where they get the 50 millionths reading. Okay. That's right. When, when, um, when they say that That's their, their headstock spindle is, is within 50 millionths of an inch total indicator run out, this is where they make the measurement at, at the collet seat right there. And the reading for the one we had had is already written here, which it met. It met that, and that's why it's that's why this came with it. That's right. It passed. Okay. Right. What we're going to share with you is what kind of reading does this classic old open style headstock get after all of that effort with those bearings and all of this work before we do this break in, before we start. We're going to show you right now in real time what kind of reading we're getting in that college seat with a tolerance given to us of 50 millionths. That's right. Well, and if I could just add something really quick. Sure. Um, okay, Lance makes a good point. You know, we estimate this headstock to be, what, about 70 years old? Right perhaps. about there. Okay. And, you know, if you can't meet that 50 millionths of an inch, 
that's fine. It is expected to yeah, not be. Yeah, you got to consider the age. And even Levin, you know, if you ship Levin a headstock for them to rebuild it, they cannot guarantee, give you that same guarantee that will be within 50 millionths of an inch. And they tell you that just because, you that know, That guarantees used. on a brand new one coming out of the factory floor. That's right. That they promise. Okay, well, I'm ready to get this started. Can we show off the results of a lot of hard effort and show yes. you what, what all that effort means in the end? And this is just the first of this. That's There's right. a lot more to come. Shall we start? Let's start. We. Okay, let's... About right speed right there? Yeah, heal me. Just enough to make that indicator dwickle. Here, let me see if I can use the loop with the camera so they can get a better... That'd be really nice. One a little faster, or you're trying to stay within one division there. That's now. right. One division is what we're after. You can go a little outside of one, but you that's go a little all. faster if you okay. want. See, boy, we're only getting. I'd have to say. So you can see it just barely move. I'd call it about ten millions. I'd say that's ten million. Yeah, I would. Can I turn that down now? Okay, you can turn so it I'm off. I'm not ready to start my breaking procedure now. That's right. Okay. Okay, we'll tell you, this is pretty incredible results. Mm -hmm. Okay, we knew the results before we started, and that's pretty incredible. Because remember, we haven't even ground the collet seat yet. It does show that hard work pays off. That's right. You know, yeah, all the effort in cleaning the parts, measuring the parts, replacing worn out parts, you know, all the little details we put in about our cleanliness and yeah, everything. But we, but we won't give it away right now. It's coming in part six. There's a big reason for all of this. Yeah. Okay, I'm finished with this for now. I'd like to go. Oh, real quick, because yeah. I just noticed it right now. I also noticed oh, that you put yeah. the reflective tape. I did. That's for this. It came with this. Yeah. I'm going to be reading. I've got to read what I'm getting because we're going to be running at 25% and 5%, 25%. That's right. 75% and then 100%. And then 100% again. So there's a big reason for that, and it's coming up, and I can't wait to have you join us for it. Yeah, this whole process is going to take at least a couple of hours, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, that's where I'll be. Yeah. So, okay, great. Well, I'm getting a little more excited here. It's time to start the break-in process. But, you know, first, before we do, let's go over the parameters of, of what we're going to be running this, this spindle at. And most importantly, let me show you how we've got it pre-set up before we start. How's that sound, Patrick? Sure, that sounds good. Okay, well, let me turn you around over here. Uh, I'm, I've already got this set. In our case, this spindle's maximum motor spindle here is maximum is a 3,200 RPM. That's all. We're, that's the maximum at 100%. Okay. So to start this though, we're going to start at just 5%, which is going to be 160 RPM. Okay, really slow. Sure. Yeah, it is really slow. It's like Pat says. Would you say about three revolutions per second or something? It's like yeah, ding, ding, ding. exactly. We see the little the little the. Uh, uh, of reflective tape go by. That's right. <laughs> okay, we've, we've already got our meters set up. We've got our K probes. See, our meters are already set up. This is the uh, surface temperature under the magnet on the surface of the bearings. So you can see we're kind of set up and just, we're not going to be monitoring that right now, actually. We just set it up because we don't want to mess with it later. That's right. And under there is where, okay, so just to put you back in perspective here where you guys know where we're at, we are on the highest speed we can get out of here, okay, on the spindle uh, pulley. There, th in the front here, this is where the two angular contact bearings are underneath here. And okay. over here is my deep groove uh, single bearing. That's right, okay. Oh, about fit. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to run this thing, and I'm going to show you all the processes we're going to run through. You know we're starting at 5%, 160 RPM. Right. Okay, so that's only going to last for what? 10 minutes? Yeah. Yeah, so okay. So we're calling that 5% for 10 minutes. Then you're going to see... See, then we're going to step it up. We're going to go for 25%, and we're going to run it through two times at 20 seconds. Stop, see, stop and rest periods. See, I'm going to do this three times here. Okay. Yeah, you'll want to download this document. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so don't worry about writing this down or anything or memorizing it. And this parameters are good for any spindle, right, Patrick? Any spindle up to, you know, any 20,000 RPM spindle. Any, any Just yeah, any spindle, any size. Any right, it doesn't speed. matter if you're a vertical CNC mill or not. This is exact procedures used. This is what you use. Yeah, and that's why uh, we indicate percentages because, you know, if your spindle runs at a maximum RPM of 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, yeah. it doesn't matter. Just take the percentage of that. Yeah. 
So we want to make this useful for all of, all of the spindles if we can. That's right. Okay, so I'm going to run through this, but then we're going to get to the 50%, and so we're going to run through these little short cycles, but we're going to run a big long one. Well, a long one meaning 15 minutes at this point, which is a long one. We're going to be watching temperature here. Yeah, the long cycles is where you really want to focus on reading the temperature meters, right? Right, and there's only two long cycles, right? One at 50% and one at 100%. That's correct. And the 100% is, this is a three hours you're going to have to allocate here, by the way, and you cannot be leaving. Once you come in here, throw away the phone, put send the kids out for one of them delicious ice creams, <laughs> and kick back and have a good time. Listen, though, don't turn the radio on. Listen to it. Listen to your motor draw on the bearings. Listen to it pull on the pulley. I, we found that to be pretty smart. That's right. Yeah, don't have the music. That's a good point. Don't have the music blasting. Because, yeah, if the bearings are squealing or something, you're going to be able to hear yeah, it. This isn't free time away from your co-workers and family here. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's pretty cool, though. <laughs> and, okay, so we're going to get back over here. And that's where we're going to be. The last cycle is going to be this 100% for one hour, and that's pretty good. And you're going to watch that temperature really close. You see, we're looking really close for 122 degrees Fahrenheit or 50 degrees Celsius. That's right. Um, for my European friends. <laughs> And, yeah, don't worry, you know, if your temperature does exceed that maximum temperature, don't worry. Don't get so concerned that yeah, it's not over. Yeah, it's not over. Oh, there's instructions in there where you're going to go back a prior step. Yep. Yeah, yeah. If, you, if you get too hot too quick, just go drop back to the, like in this case, if the hour gets too hot too fast at the 100%, you're going to have to drop back to the 50%. I want you to climb back up through this again. That's right. Follow those procedures really closely again, no matter what how tedious that sounds, it actually works. That's right. And you might save everything here. It may not be a problem you think it is. Yes. Okay. And that's, uh, so I'm not going to be, you're not going to have to sit here and watch me for three hours. I'm going to sit here and be cozy with my ears focused on this here and my eyes listening, watching there, so. Sure, I may periodically uh, come in, see how you're doing, or if, I'm sure if you run into any issues, you'll call me. I'll be screaming. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, we've okay. come this far; we don't want any trouble. So yeah. Okay, well, I think that's it. I think I'll get started. And I'll have you back along the way. I want to go ahead and start it. Oh, ready? Yeah. Just so they can see the the beginnings. Ooh. There it goes. Oh, yeah, this gives you a good idea what five percent looks like on the eleven. Yeah, this one's pretty good. I think you can see, see? it really good with the. Uh, Reflective tape. See that? Three resolutions per second or so going on there, whatever's happening. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> See, those temperature gauges, nothing's going to move. There's not enough. And 10 minutes. Huh? Yeah, I'll be here for 10 minutes. Okay, great. So everybody knows where I'll be. Great. Bye. -bye. I'll, I'll check back. Thanks. Okay, we're back again. And Lance is actually still at the first step, but he wanted to add something. Yeah, one little reminder that I forgot to share with you and a little update on some progress that's, that change has been made here. Um, we're seeing a, an increase in the temperature here. Uh, this, is, this represents the uh, rear bearing and this represents the angular contacts in the front. So the deep groove and the front angular contacts, right? That's okay. Okay, and you'll see we've, we've only been running about five minutes into this 10 minutes at 5%. And we've already seen an increase of just one degree. So this reminds me, there's two things I need you to do because we all get distracted when we're playing in a workshop. So we want to always make sure you kind of just do what I'm doing. I'm charting. So I've noted that I started, say, at 10, 10, and by 10, 20, I'll be done with this 160 RPM run at 10 minutes. Okay, and okay, got that? So I'm doing that, and I'm also making sure I mark my temperatures down. See, because I just want to know what my base temperatures are to start, but mainly I need you to do that when, when you're at the, the longer runs, the 50% for, for 15 minutes and then the 100% um, for one hour. We want, a, we want a starting temperature so we know where, right. where you started or so you'll know how, what your increases are, both front and rear. And it's always just good to get a baseline reading of everything. Yes. You know, just you know what, what you started with at the very beginning. So right. I forgot to mention that to you, so that's why I had you back. Oh, and real quick, that temperature difference he showed you, Actually, it climbed out at 1.2 degree, degree difference, and that's normal. The reason why you're seeing that temperature difference is because the angular contact bearings are preloaded, and it's that preload. It's that resistance plan. Yeah, that roller. resistance. That's part of it, you know, so. So nothing so, to get alarmed about. Yeah, nothing to get alarmed about. You're going to see that that's normal. Again, we don't, we're only focused or concerned on temperature spikes. Right. So, okay, well, thanks for that. Part 4, Section 4, Performing the Break-In Procedure. 
Okay, we have you back for a real quick little update here, just for a second. The machine's off now, which means I finished that 10-minute run for at the 5% ratio, and everything's, just so you know, it's coming along just fine. We're getting ready to move into the 25% range, though, 800 RPMs in this case. And we're going to do this six times. You're going to go from zero, after a cooling period, zero to, to the 800 RPMs, and you're going to do that. And, and you're going to do that to six times. So we don't want we want to play that game about the centrifugal force, the buildup. And, and in this meter or this this uh, controller is smart. So when I turn it on, it has a two to three second delay to get the spindle up to 800 RPM. That gets it there gradually. That's right. Okay, and Patrick's really good on this one because you can't just snap to 800 or snap to 2,000. Nah, not yeah, on this. Because it reminded us, right? Because we we purposely set up our startup time for about two seconds but then we realized well guys some people they they may have the startup time or no startup time at right, all straight up yeah may, maybe just instant on and yeah you definitely don't want that so what i want you to do is i know it's a, a pain okay i know you want to set it and then you could just like do this you know stop and go thing six times because you got to do this so many times sure, different, right. different percentages of rpm and all that but trust me it's worth it it's a gradual part of the break and it's really better for the bearings better for the long-term life of the spindle yeah. So I stopped in for that, so I'll probably see you back in a little while. I don't think I'll need to bother anymore for a little bit. Sure. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, I thought I'd check up on Lance because he just finished the 50% long cycle. And he's still smiling, so the good news is great. It's actually great news. Um, we're, I just finished the 50%, which means we just finished the 1600 RPM cycle, and I'm going to step up to the 20, 2400 now. Okay. And... Uh, and the good news was we're seeing the differentials we want to see here in the temperature gauge. Now, it's cooling now because it's been a few minutes because I sure. have the cool down period before I move on to the next stage. Right. Which is because I just finished a long 15-minute run. So I had to have a five-minute uh, stop period of cooling time before we start the 75%. Okay. Okay, so what we were getting is kind of similar to what you're seeing but in bigger numbers. We were getting... We had about a five degree difference between the back and the front. The deep groove bearing was, was running cooler, which it should. It's just a stabilizer bearing. Where the two angular contact bearings, as Patrick clearly tells you, are highly resistant to one. You know, there's resistance there. Right, the preload uh, adds that extra resistance. And it which, shows in the heat meters, yeah. which is what you want to see. Yeah, what you don't want to see is no differential between the two bearing no. types. Yeah, no. so. So yeah, you, so what you're saying is you're seeing exactly what we look for. That yeah. small differential, not excessive heat, but also not the same temperature between all. Yeah, and it got comfortably warm during the whole 15 minutes. Nothing's heading anywhere near that parameter of 122 degrees. Nothing near Perfect. that. Perfect. So it's really nice. It's high 80s range. Feel pretty good about it. Sounds great, by the way. I wish you could hear that. But sure, uh, I'm heading up toward that 100% after I get through the 75%. And that'll wrap this up. And if I hope you'll be back to see a bigger smile than this one. <laughs> Great, can't wait. All right. Okay, thanks. Okay, we're back with Lance, and he's at the final step at the 100% one hour. That's right, and I'm taking readings every five minutes to monitor any kind of change in the rear bearing and the, and the twin angular contact bearing. I'm running at 100%, 3200 RPM, stable as a rock. It sounds good. It, it just feels good. The temperature, look what I'm looking to see. We're looking for equilibrium here. And there's a range we're given, and that's what we're trying to hold. Okay, I see that. Yeah, the differential is about 7 degrees, it looks like. That's and between the rear uh, deep crew bearing and the angular contact bearings. Oh, and that, even that, uh, the 100.7, that's a really good to see. And how long has it been running? Well, we're in it, uh, I'm in it, uh, let's see, right in I mean, all 30 minutes. You're, you're halfway here. You're, all, you're coming ah. to the end of halfway. So. so about halfway, and it, it did... It stabilized. Yeah, these were climbing quite quite rapidly, about 4 degrees per 5-minute period, right? 3, 5, 4 degrees. Yeah, we were talking about that. It, uh, it is kind of... When you're doing this for the first time, it can get scary because you can see the temperature jump really rapidly, and you're going you're gonna to think, wow... You know, please stop. You oh, know. Yeah, please. But it does. It does equal out. <laughs> yeah, so just, and, um, yeah, because very rare, it's very rare that we see any issues. But um, the jumps, you, you never get used to the jumps. <laughs> but, but we'll share our final read. We'll share our final uh, temperatures at the closing. 
in the closing. Would that be nice? Oh, that'd be nice to share. See hey, this is what, this is what we ended up with after a full hour and the final run. We're done after this. We're off to the grinder. So, Great. Yeah. Well, that's good news. I'll see you at the end. All right. Okay, we're back, and I think we're ready for closure, huh? Oh, oh yeah. Hi, hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dancing a little here. <laughs> we uh, we hit a we hit a high on the temperatures about about 20 minutes ago. Right about 20, 25 minutes ago, and it's been coming down a little bit since. So we got that equilibrium perfect and started to drop off. Now we're really stable. We've and dropped way down from the high there. And you got only about five minutes left, right? I'm on my last four minutes. Uh, I've got, yeah, I've got about, about three and a half minutes left, but it made it. We, we can now tell you the spindle is successful. Uh, the break-in is successful. Look at the temperature stabilized. Remember, they were like 101. Oh, 99. yeah. And they were, um, and they were here. We were at ninety, I believe ninety, just 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 at ninety four, right at ninety three nine, ninety three four. So it's been like this now for the last two. We take a reading every five minutes. It's been that way for the last three or four readings. So we're pretty stabilized here. So you're seeing exactly what we want to see. And what the if, yeah, exactly what you want to see, and exactly what the bearing manufacturers hope hope we obtain. Great. And so shall you. Well, we'll see you over at the closing in a few. Okay, sounds good. A few more minutes. All right, thank okay. you. Part 4, Section 5, Final Thoughts. Well, that was an absolutely amazing spindle break-in. Oh. I hate to say it, but say it anyway. Okay, well, I'll say this was a textbook example of a perfect break-in procedure on a machine spindle. I mean, if you didn't weren't here, if you could have been here with us, you'd have you'd realize that was not staged for the camera. <laughs> yeah, because you can't really. You know, we've done a lot of these, and you can't predict the outcome. Oh, it's a seventy-year-old uh, headstock. We have no idea. Right. So that's why we're ecstatic because you know it always turns out to be the other way. You know, the the spindle that you want to record. Turns out to be the worst spindle you've ever done or something, you know. But this one, actually, we're really happy because we're able to share with you a really good example of the outcome you should see on the break-in procedure. Yeah, we, wanted you, we want you to have these results, so we weren't hoping we could capture it on film, and we, in fact, we did. Yeah. But, but before I get to get into how well I matched, I want Patrick has something he wants to share about what the goal was. Yeah, this is why I'm happy is because, okay, Kluber, you know, being the manufacturer of the spindle grease we use on the bearings, okay, they have a they have a piece of documentation called the Bearing Lubrication Procedures. Okay, and they talk about, you know, th their recommended breaking procedures. Everybody has breaking procedures, you know, like we talked about. Okay, and one of the things they say at the very end is after running the breaking procedure, and you're at the final stage, or you've completed it. Okay, what they indicate is they, their ideal equilibrium temperature that they like to see, and the, equi and the equilibrium means the temperature that the bearings have settled. So you've run through all the break-in procedures, and at the very end, you've finalized it, and it's at that temperature, because you're going to see, you know, during the procedure, we mentioned that you're going to see temperature spikes. Okay, so this We is, shared a little of that along the way here. That's right. So this is after those spikes, this is where the temperature has settled. And what Kluber's saying is they like to see a temperature between 95 and 105 Fahrenheit, or that's roughly 35 to 40 centigrade. Okay, so, and what did we settle at? Well, when, when we got all, once we peaked out at about 50% through as we shared, okay. we had peaked out up there at the uh, double angular contacts at 101.4. So we didn't really, we were fortunate that we didn't see any significant temperature spikes. Just oh, slight. yeah, no, because we started at 85 degrees. Right. You know, okay. it, it, we always want to take a, a start reading or you're not going to know where you're at. Sure. Based on where you live or work or how your, how your setup is. Right. And on that rear bearing, we started out at about 83 and we hit an all time peak that really was amazing. It goes to show you about the, about the angular contact bearings difference between that and the deep groove bearing. The deep right. groove bearing runs along just as stable as a rock. I right. mean, after an hour, it's no different than it was at half an hour. <laughs> and it come in at 93.8 degrees, but it wasn't, it, it moved up like three or four degrees the whole time. It just doesn't, it doesn't have any, um, 
preloaded it. Right, it has no preload, so there weren't, weren't those uh, spikes. The drama's in the yeah. dual angler contact bearings, but they settled out at 99.4 degrees. <laughs> See, and that's what's amazing is our equilibrium temperature is almost dead center of what Kluber likes to see. A full hour later. Yeah. And all that so, pre-testing, mind you. All that's been going on for four hours, three, four hours. And right. There you go, you know. Yeah. So we're really proud. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, we couldn't, you know, these are results that you just, you couldn't be more happy. Or you said it. They're them. textbook. Yeah, they're textbook examples. And don't count on that. that yeah. Just, I, we just have a lot of luck. Yeah. So I think that's Very about it. Planning. Okay. But overall, any input on the braking procedure? Or anything you saw unusual or... I think I did all this like I've always done it on these pieces of notebook paper. I think we can benefit others trying this at home, I believe, by creating a document for them to fill in the blanks. Oh, like, sure. So they can, and, and it can fit any spindle bearing be rebuilt. It has nothing to do with this. You know, it's not just for 11. It's kind That'd of. That'd be a lot better because we've always done on notebook paper. I right? just scribble along, yeah, right. because we don't have to do it for somebody else. We Now we're doing it for you, so. Okay, now we can do that. We'll make we'll, we'll, nice. we'll make a nice little chart so you can just fill in all the little blanks. That'd be a lot I think better. That'd be really nice. Oh, and we are going to share all these all these results. Uh, absolutely, our right. test results. We're proud of them anyway. We were going to share right. them regardless. We are. We're here to tell you. We're going to do. We're going to share whatever it is we get. That's right. If it was a disaster, we would have shared it. That's just the exactly. way it is. Yeah. Right. So okay. No great. Oh, and I just a little tip. Oh. Just one more little tip. Sure. Look. You're going to see all this, you know, run this for 20 seconds, do this two times in a row, cool between between runs for one minute, and uh, the RPM has to be exactly 50%. Uh, no, no, no. The goal is what this is insinuating. What, what, we, what we're saying here is if you're plus or hopefully just minus uh, 50 RPM. That's what we shoot for, right? Close plus enough. I'm using a little RPM gauge, a little piece of... Str I have no idea if it's yeah, that accurate. And that's true. Don't and sit there and... And if the clock goes past, just have a clock right there. I suggest you add a yeah. clock to your parts list <laughs> or your uh, tool list because it's a little hard. But you, but you want to, you know, you, you could run a little over, come up a little short. But you, these are just basic guidelines. just want you to kind of hold somewhat close to these parameters as a goal. Right. Try your best. Try right. your best. But you're, it's really a, a tedious process. It, it is. It's a very focused one. But you can do it. But but don't worry if it's a little out and a little off. That's not going to, you know, you're not going to some uh, bearing court. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, okay. That's okay, it. great. Well, thank well, you. Great. I'll see you in, uh, in the next part then. Right. I think this uh, this finalizes uh, part four. All right. So I guess we're off to grinding. Uh oh. If necessary. If necessary. Yeah. You know what? That that's a thing we Some... got to discuss because, it, as you saw earlier, the uh, run out at the collet seat was we measured at about ten millionths of an inch. If we're lucky, if we squeeze yeah. that. I mean, that we're just being drama there. I'm, I, there's really nothing there, but we're gonna do it anyway. Yeah, so either we'll probably maybe grind that collet seat just to show an example, because we've got to show you guys something for part five. And you may or may not need to grind yours either. Right. You if, may be done right here. Right, if you're seeing great, right, That's a maybe that's a good, uh, Some. I'm glad we brought it up. Yeah, if the condition of your collet seat is, is still in great condition, and you're getting great measurements, you know, very minimal run out within specification, there's no need to uh, grind the collet seat. Yeah, right? just to grind it. Right, so you don't want to just grind it to grind it. Okay, but in our case, we may do it just to show an example for we you guys. We need to document this. I need yeah. to close it. There's people who need it and people who don't need it. We're going to have to take it all the way through. Right. I'd rather not, but we're going to have to do it. Yeah, we're doing we it just have, for you. Exactly. So, you know, that's a good case, right? I mean, good, it's good you mentioned that. Okay, well, that'll do it. See you at part, part, uh, part five. Great. As watchmakers and micro machinists, Patrick and I thank you for following along with us while we take this journey. We look forward to bringing you another exciting show shortly.